Now Gaza, a small territory of about 360 kilometers, was already experiencing a severe humanitarian crisis before the current hostilities broke out. The Gaza aid move is the first crack in a punishing 10-day siege on the Palestinian enclave after the deadliest single attack on Israelis in history. And here's all you need to know about this. Concerns are mounting about dwindling supplies and warnings of a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. The Rafah crossing is the only way in or out of the Gaza Strip, not controlled by Israel. You can see the map here. The Rafah crossing has remained shut during the war as Israel has struck the Palestinian side. Aid is piled up in convoys of trucks waiting in Egypt. Israeli leaders agreed to Biden's request to allow aid into the besieged Gaza Strip via Egypt. The Israeli Prime Minister's office stated the Rafah crossing agreement, it was limited to food, water and medicine and conditional on it not being used by Hamas. That's the condition. Biden said Egypt president agreed to let up to 20 trucks through initially. The US president added that the shipment, it would likely not cross until Friday as the road around this crossing that needs repairs. UN humanitarian chief Martin Griffiths estimated that about 100 trucks per day were needed to meet the demand in Gaza. Initially, there are only going to be about 20, as I mentioned. Egyptian presidential spokesperson announced the sustainable passage of humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip through the Rafah crossing. However, he did not specify a date. Biden said the UN would distribute the aid on the other side and that a second tranche was possible, depending on how that goes. But he did warn, if Hamas confiscates it, it doesn't let it get through, then it's going to end. So those are the conditions put forth for the time being. Now for more on this, we are being joined by a principal diplomatic correspondent, Siddhan Sibbal, who is joining us live from Tel Aviv. Also on the show, we are being joined by former Under Secretary of Defense under George Bush administration, uh, Mr. Dov Zahim, and current senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us on the show. Thank you. Now, Sidhan, let me come to you first. What can you tell us of the situation on ground? As I mentioned, the aid, that is something that's come out of a U.S. President Joe Biden's trip to Israel. What can you tell us? Well, uh, the situation on ground remains serious uh, here in Tel Aviv. We know that this city came under a barrage of rocket attacks uh, just hours after U.S. President Joe Biden left yesterday. And now, of course, uh, we know the big worry is that if the Israeli side plans to mount a ground offensive in Gaza. There has already been a build-up. Uh, we have been in the southern part of Israel where we have seen movement of the troops and the tanks. But uh, before that, two things are the big priority for the Israeli government. First, the release of the hostages. And second, to send a message to Hamas that there will be a strong action. Ahead of that, we know that uh, World leaders have been traveling to Israel, including uh, uh, an expected visit of the UK Prime Minister later today to show solidarity with the Israeli leaders. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Sidan. Stay with us. I'll get back to you. I just want to sl uh, now slide over to our guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Zakim. I just want to take your opinion on, you know, your thoughts on this. Now, uh, of course, the Rafa border is expected to open soon, but uh, overall, Given the plans that were there for the U.S. president before he landed in Israel, and there were a lot of changes in those plans when he finally stepped foot on Israeli soil, what do you feel Biden achieved with his visit to Israel? Well, first of all, you got it right. <laughs> I am a doctor. Um, ah. <laughs> I think he achieved a lot. Uh, and uh, I think that had he not gone, I don't think Netanyahu would have opened that border. Uh, Netanyahu, I think, now would probably use Mr. Biden's visit as an excuse to his extreme right wing partners that he had no choice. So Biden succeeded in doing something that I personally had advocated in many articles I'd written, which was if Israel wanted to clear out the northern part of Gaza, it had to make humanitarian provisions for the southern part. So food, water, medicine, I would add, frankly, electricity to that. Uh, at least it looks like it's going to begin. Uh, and that was due to Mr. Biden's conversation with President al-Sisi. Uh, 20 trucks is clearly not enough. I have a lot of respect for Martin Griffiths. Uh, I don't know whether 100 is right, but 20 is certainly not enough. 
But it's a start. It's a very important start. And it's frankly a test of whether Hamas cares about it, the people at all or is simply interested in just starving them out while fighting with the Israelis. So that's a major, mm -hmm. I think, success for Mr. Biden. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, very, very important, Mr. Biden put the lie to the idea that it was Israel that destroyed the hospital. It wasn't. And it's not a matter of believing the Israeli Defense Forces spokesman. I happen to have been, as you said, an undersecretary of defense, and I put a lot of trust in our intelligence people. And it's our intelligence people, and not only ours, that concluded that, in fact, it was a misfired uh, Islamic Jihad rocket. So again, I think Mr. Biden, on the one hand, reassured Israelis. He also made it clear that one has to be caring uh, for all these displaced Palestinians who are innocent people. And finally, that he got Egypt to do something that it wasn't ready to do until today. Uh, right. Now, Dr. Zakim, just based on what you've said, Biden did mention that the border crossing from Egypt to Gaza will be open for humanitarian aid. Now, the question is, when the aid does come in, who do you feel will take charge of it? Who controls Gaza at the moment? Well, uh, it, it's clear that uh, Hamas might try to, but I think the deal is that the United Nations, uh, I presume under Martin Griffith's leadership, uh, will be the ones uh, providing the supplies. And if it is indeed the UN, I, I wonder whether Hamas would be so brazen as to try to steal things from the United Nations. It's obviously got to be uh, uh, an organization that is humanitarian, um, that is nonpartisan, that doesn't have, a, 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 as we would say in America, a dog in this particular fight, mm -hmm. uh, and whose only purpose is to hand out the food, the water, the medicines, and maybe make the electricity work. Uh, I would very much hope that it is the UN and uh, the UN affiliated agencies. Right, Dr. Zakim, stay with us. I just want to cut over to uh, our correspondent Siddhant, you're on ground. Now, there is no specific date which has been given or a time, of course, which has been given regarding when this humanitarian aid is expected to come in to Gaza. When can we see that happen? And do you have any more inputs on that? Well, so far, nobody can give any time when the aid can reach uh, into Gaza from the Rafah border, mm -hmm. from Egypt, because yesterday, mm -hmm. Israel said that uh, no aid is coming from Israeli side to Gaza mm. unless the hostages, the release of the hostages happen. And this is the condition that uh, the Israeli side has put. But even as we speak, we know the situation is deteriorating. Uh, we also know that uh, Israel, Israeli side has said that it is targeting Hamas hideouts. But um, in the fog of war, anything can happen. While we saw the explosion in the Gaza hospital and we saw the blame game by the two sides, the Palestinian side, the Israeli side, the Israeli side um, saying that it is because of the failed uh, rocket launch by uh, the Islamic uh, Jihad. And we also saw the U.S. president uh, saying it's because of the other team clearly blaming mm. out um, uh, the 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 militant groups in uh, Gaza, but essentially it yes. could take some time Siddhant, before any aid can reach Gaza. Yeah, Siddhant. Also, you know, yesterday when we were discussing with you, you were standing with a lot of families of uh, families of those who have been taken hostage. Talk to us about the hostage situation. You did mention it a little earlier, you know, while answering. What is it currently, and is there any update on when they can be expected back, or any talks regarding the crossover of the hostages back home? Well, the number one priority for the Israeli government is the release of the hostages. Approximately 200 hostages are in Hamas custody and almost on a daily basis there are protests here in Tel Aviv by the family members of the hostages hoping uh, that the government will act on. Now, this is a very precarious situation and um, any show of force inside Gaza uh, can lead to a change mm. on the lives of these hostages. And we saw how Hamas released a picture of one of the hostages as mm -hmm. well that increased concerns regarding the hostages. There are press conferences happening. There is, in fact, a wall, there are walls where posters have been put up of people who have been kidnapped. Almost across this city, you mm -hmm. will see uh, pictures being posted of people who have been kidnapped. So there are strong mm -hmm. concerns. The Israeli government is under pressure mm -hmm. by its people for the release of the hostages. But nobody can surely say when the hostages can be released. And with the each right. passing day, uh, hope, of course, diminishes uh, and concerns increases. Right. Uh
Dr. Zakim, thank you so much for staying with us. Coming back to you now, tensions and protests have spread across several nations in West Asia as well. There are now fears of a wider conflict and instability. What is your take on this? What should we expect going forward? Well, again, I think uh, Mr. Biden's visit may have tamped down some of that very, very dangerous situation you've just described. And the reason I say that is because even though there is clear anger in the Arab street. Uh, many of the governments uh, that frankly did sign up to the uh, Organization of Islamic States uh, condemnation of Israel uh, have been relatively um, quiet uh, about all of this. And yes, they've issued some statements, but not much more than that. And I think the reason for that uh, is first of all, Biden's very, very strong support for Israel. Secondly, because, uh, as you may recall, he and Prime Minister Maloney of Italy and uh, Chancellor Schultz of Germany and President Macron of France and uh, Prime Minister uh, Sunak uh, of the UK signed a joint statement on October 9th, basically condemning what Hamas did. And there seems to be uh, a still a, a strong coalescing of those five in support of Israel. Now, given that, it seems to me that the Arab governments are essentially pacing themselves and waiting to see what happens and waiting to see whether the demonstrations will calm down. And frankly, a lot of it will depend, as your correspondent has made very, very clear, on how the humanitarian assistance mm -hmm. actually materializes. Mm. Uh, it can't go on for days and days and days yeah. because there are too many people at risk. So that is going to be important, and I suspect that the United States government and the other governments are mm -hmm. going to continue to press Mr. Sisi, uh, President Sisi, to let more of those trucks in. Mm -hmm. To the extent that happens, I think it'll be easier for the Arab governments to withstand the clear pressures from their populations to take uh, stronger action than they've done so far. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zakim, for joining in. Uh, and sharing all your insights on this. And uh, Siddhant, of course, we'll be tracking you know, all the updates with you on ground through the day. That was Siddhant Sibyl, also joining us from Tel Aviv. Thank you, both of you all, for joining. Thank you.